Okay, we're taking a look at the World War I Jewel Pack by the game designer Ted Racer. And this was published by GMT in 2014. Now these two games actually came out uh, in 1993-1994. When Eagles Fight was the first one, 1993, and the next year, Glory's End. And they both concern two campaigns that are of particular interest to me in World War I. I find them interesting because uh, they take place in 1914 and they are at a time when the war, World War I, was still a war of movement. It didn't bog down to the trench warfare that uh, it would later become. Now both games are very similar in format. It's kind of core level. They're not exactly the same, so there are rules differences. You will have to read both rules books to uh, play the game. Now, I've set this up and played, I'm on turn four right now on the Eastern Front. Now, players are not liable to make the mistakes that some of the Russians did. And uh, I think it boils down to kind of a stalemate situation here. I've got the Russians in green, the Germans are in this dark gray, the Austro-Hungarians are in light gray. So what's the system like? What's this game all about? Now, I understand the maps have been redone slightly from the original. They're quite nice looking, very functional. The components are very good. And the charts are well done, as we expect from any GMT product. So this is the combat results table from when Eagles fight. Now, the game doesn't use a lot of terrific innovations. It's pretty well your basic hex grid move and kind of combat game but um, what I was a bit unused to is they are not rigid zones of control not rigid in fact the term zones of control is not even used in the game so in theory this unit here this core unit for example Russian could keep on moving right through the line of course you'd have to obey the line of communications and supply rules but uh, it's very uh, World War One like in the sense that you better can keep a continuous line along your front. Uh, what also makes it interesting is if you do get a hole like this, for example, and the enemy tries to go through it, you'll be able to sort of beat him back. So there's not a lot I can say about this game. It's just uh, a good basic hexagon uh, war game. And... Uh, I, I like it a lot. As we would expect, the combat results table doesn't have a lot of decisive results unless you get very high odds, like 5 to 1 and over. There is a uh, step reduction system, but it's very limited. In uh, One Eagle's Fight, the Russian pieces are very, very brittle. So when they are asked to take a step, you flip them over and many times they're destroyed. Now they can be rebuilt again through the replacement procedure, which you keep track of on a little track here. And uh, the Austro-Hungarians are also very brittle. Some of them have a second side, others do not. The Germans are not as brittle they have a second side, and the German army inherently has a few advantages at the core level. They get to add one to their dice. Line of supply is simple but elegant. Basically, you've got to be able to trace five hexes to a town or rail, which leads off the east end of the board for the Russians, and the same for the Germans. The Germans have, well, both sides have strategic movement where you can move uh, cores long distances and they show the deterioration of the Russian railroads by having a different level of strategic movement in 1914 and 1915, 1916, so on. Now lately I've been watching a lot of documentaries on World War I, some great uh, footage even saw a colorized one, which was very good. And uh, it was from Germany. And uh, the 
historian in there had a different take on the Battle of Tannenberg. That uh, occurred here in this space. Basically what happened at Tannenberg was a Russian army uh, got uh, surrounded and destroyed. And it was one of the decisive battles of World War I. But as he pointed out, though it was decisive, Russian army taken out of the war, it um, didn't really end the war in the east by any means. Uh, the Russians were still a force to be reckoned with, though it stabilized that front. So it did have great effects, the Battle of Tannenberg. But um, it didn't end the war in the east. The Russians kept an army in the field, of course, until the uh, Russian Revolution. Another nice feature is this random events table. You can see that events can happen between turns 5 and 11, and a different set of events turns 12 through 24. This game is going to take you quite a bit of time to play, though. It's not a short game. It's uh, quite good. Anyway, when you get a random event uh, occur, you go to the text here, and various things can happen. The Tsar takes command, major offensive on the Western Front, and you just simply do what uh, the random event uh, states. One of the victory conditions for the Germans is that you want to cause the fall of the Tsar. That occurs, you virtually won the game. The other is that you want to occupy territory. So the uh, Germans are trying to occupy Russian territory, of course. And the um, Russians, of course, are doing uh, the opposite. They're trying to occupy German territory. So it's a push and pull game all along the front. And uh, very World War-like. It simulates World War I combat very well on the core and army level. I don't have much more to say about this uh, twin pack. Uh, Glory's End uses, like I said, a similar system. has a bit uh, different sequence of play. It's got something I like here, uh, where you do the uh, operational movement and march combat phase, and then it has its own dedicated prepared combat phase. So you can move and fight, or if people have been beside enemy units, they can do a prepared combat phase. So you've almost got two separate combat phases back to back, kind of like that. Uh, the rules are uh, well illustrated. It's a well done game. Uh, what's different about this one? Well, of course, it's the Western Front. And that's another area I like to explore. So you're going to do the Schlieffen plan, go through Belgium try to turn the French left flank and maybe capture Paris. Uh, so the opening months of the war in 1914, I find are very interesting. Uh, you've also got a um, uh, different setups. You can do a French secret setup and a German secret setup. Um, I prefer usually to <clears throat> follow the historical setup, but uh, for those of you who want more uh, of an open game, you can do that. Okay, wrapping up, I know that this is a very short video on the game. Um, there just isn't a lot more I can say about it. Uh, this is almost more from my own records, just so I remember it if I don't play these things in, in a while. But this interest in World War I has sort of hit me in the last, I don't know, six months or so. I've been playing a lot of uh, The Lamps Are Going Out by Compass, which I think is a very fine game. And uh, I guess a madness came over me. I've actually ordered the old Avalon Hill 1914, which I've only played once, and that was way back in 1969. And uh, back in 69, when we only had experience with games like U-Boat and Midway and Gettysburg, we were kind of overwhelmed by 1914. But I've ordered that, and uh, maybe I'll do a video uh, on that at some future time. So that's it for 1914, Glory's End, and uh, When Eagles Fight. Um, apologies if a video doesn't tell you much more than you were expecting. But uh, thank you for watching, and that's it.